You know, um, <laughs> come together and we're looking at a sunrise service and then coming to praise the Lord today. Just a wonderful, wonderful uh, event this morning. And, you know, being able to come together and worship our Lord and Savior. So here at Calvary Chapel, we're teaching through the book of Colossians. So if you would like to turn there, uh, if you don't have a Bible, raise your hand and one of the ushers will get you a Bible. Just leave your hand up and you can take that Bible home with you if you like, make it a good friend of yours. We want you to have it. We want you to, to uh, we, just, we just happen to be right here in Colossians and I just thought it was a good place to be for our text this morning and we'll be teaching through the book of Colossians um, and we want you to follow along with this. This is what's important. It's important that we look and see. I want you to see from your pages, from these the pages that God is, you know, this is God's word. This is how it's broken down. This is how, you know, you, you're watching it come to life from our pages into our hearts. And so we want to make sure that, you know, that you're following along. Yes, this is what it says. Sure enough, that's what the word of God says. And so we're, we left off, we just opened Colossians last week. We're going to pick up verses 13 through 20 this morning, and, and I want to just uh, kind of get you up to speed for a minute. We have, um, there's this incorrect teaching that has come into Colossae, into the city, and uh, it was written to Paul. They had come to Paul and they said, Epaphras said, you know, there's, there's some issues that we have. How do we take care of them? And so Paul, beginning yesterday, he, or last week, he encouraged them, and he came to them sharing with them some of the things that he saw, that, you know, that their faith was strong, he, their hope was strong, their love was strong, but he also wanted to and needed to address the issue that's before them today. And I think uh, that was before them then, and today it's, it just so much speaks to our heart, um, especially on a day like this, when we come to Resurrection Sunday, we come to a day to where... You know, there's, who do I believe in? Who, who is the right answer? Who's the right answer for life? What do I do? And you know, whenever you go to fill out a job and a career, maybe you're, you're making a career switch, and you have this resume, and you want to fill it out, and you want to make sure that you sell yourself. And, and, and that's what we do, right? We sell ourselves to make us, make sure we fit that mold. And they say, hey, that guy's qualified, that gal, she's qualified for that position. Well, in a sense, what we look at today is, Paul is telling the church in Colossae, he's telling them, listen, there's a, there's a Savior, and in these passages here, there's a resume that is fit for him to be called the Savior of the world. And so he doesn't have to sell himself. He's already shown his love for us. He died on the cross, speaking of Jesus. He was buried and rose again to substantiate that. And that's what we're going to look at. I think, you know, I love for, uh, the video that you saw was what we closed our Friday service with. And if you look at the events looking back to the cross of Jesus Christ, during that cross, you know, somebody, uh, the time of the cross, somebody might ask the question, well, what was God doing during that time? You know, and, and you want to look at that because in all, of, all the eyes of mankind, they couldn't figure it out. The disciples really didn't have a clue of what was taking place. Even the many of the religious leaders, they believed in him, but they didn't want to go forward with their public announcement because they didn't want to confess him, fearing that they might be Put out of the synagogue. How would you like that? You want to come to Christ and your family disowns you. But today that's equivalent to people coming to Jesus and they might not be accepted by maybe family or friends or they might not be accepted by, you know, the society around them. But Jesus still reigns. In the end, he's still the victor. And being a Christian today may mean that, you know, you may look at it and say, well, it's not totally, it's not socially acceptable. I'm okay with that. And one, one day, the one, the one day they crucified Christ, there was questions to why, no doubt. And why did this man, supposing to be a king, if he was a king, why did he die? Why didn't he just restore the economy and restore the Jewish people back to power? Why didn't he just do away with Rome? Why, did, why, why, why? And that's kind of a common thing that we have today. Why, why is that? And it still goes out today. But Jesus wasn't here to set the world straight, but he was looking at the world, the pearls in the world. He was looking at you and I, he was looking at the people that he wanted to redeem out of the world because he knew that, the, that, that there was going to be eternal uh, eternity attached to our life. And he wanted us to know, just like he wanted the, the Col people of Colossae to know, he wanted them to know that, you know, the life will go on. We will live forever. 
But depending on what we do with Jesus, that's what matters. And so these people here, you know, I think of uh, the people in Colossae when, when Jesus died and all over really uh, Israel, they wanted to be redeemed from the Roman rule. They wanted to be redeemed from the bondage. They wanted to be redeemed from the heaviness of the, the oppression of the government. But Jesus had more in mind, and he has more in mind today too. I'm sure some of us, if not all of us, would like changes to be made politically, globally. But we have one who doesn't need to be a politician that has all the answers, and that is Jesus. And this morning, we're going to answer that question, what was God doing? That's where we left off Friday. What was he doing? And if he's done all that he said he can do, then what substantiates? What gives him the right to say that he can do this uh, that he can be the Savior of the world. What gives him that right? I mean, where is his credentials at? And then, what is our response? What should our response look like? And so really, two things that we'll break down in these seven verses or so is number one, what has he done for us? The first is, what has he done for us? If he claims to be God, then uh, what has he done for us? And I mean, really, nobody needs to be full of just a lot of hot air making false claims. We hear that about every four years. Well, we need to know if he is going to make these claims, what's going to substantiate them? What credentials does he have? And that's the second thing we'll look at, is what credentials does he have to allow these claims to be authenticated? There's a lot of people, again, to be claiming to be God in one way or another. But what is it that separates this true God from imposters? And we'll look at seven claims today. Look at verse 13 as we begin our study. Here we see that what has Jesus done for those who have placed their faith in them. And you think, wow, this is incredible because the first thing that he points out, Paul writes to them, and he wants the church to be reminded of, he says, listen, he has delivered us from the power of darkness. And so he wanted these people to know that in Colossae that were being, they were being pulled aside into some other false religions and some, some of the earlier, before it was uh, credited Gnosticism, uh, they were out there t- telling them that, well, if you know Jesus, that's fine, but there's more than that. And Paul was saying, listen, look to Jesus because he alone is the answer. And he alone, as he begins to start off, he says, he's delivered us. It's not anything else that you've done. It's not anything else that you can do. And, and you know, when you come to this place in life, and every one of us has something in common, that we were born with a need for a Savior. We were born with the problem, we inherited sin, not that it was our choice, but we just came with the package. And it's not by his choice that we would not be delivered because, you know, of the choice that each of us have made, we still need to be rescued. And so God's choice, he sent his son to deliver those, whoever would call upon him, that they would, they would call upon him and he would rescue them, he would deliver them. And so it's our choice that he gives us, I've done my part. And a part was a great act of love. And so Paul was reminding the church of Colossae, he says, you know, don't get pulled aside by anything else. Don't get pulled aside, but understand that this is a great act of love and that he came to do that we, he came to do what we could not do on our own. And there's power in this world and then the power is called the prince of, uh, the prince and it's prince of Satan And he desires to keep people deceived. He wants them to uh, think that they're okay without God. He wants them to, you know, just think, you can make it through life without surrendering your life to Jesus. He wants them to think that way. And he doesn't want you to know that Jesus is the only one. He's the only way. He doesn't want you to know that he's qualified to substantiate what his claims are. He doesn't want you to know that he can deliver you out of darkness. He would rather keep you there. He'd rather keep people there today. Divide them on public is- or on on, uh, on public issues or or on uh, you know any of the issues of life, the political issues. Divide them over that and keep them thinking. Let's be divided on this or let's go after this or let's look at how bad the world is or whatever it might be. And Jesus is sitting here saying, you know, <laughs> I have the answer. I have the answer in life. He's the one that can deliver us. And he's the one. He doesn't want, you know, he being the principalities of the air. Satan, he doesn't want us to know that. He doesn't want people to know that. That's why people are sticking needles in their arms. This is why they're committing suicide at a high rate. He doesn't want them to know that they can be delivered. And Jesus died for every one of us that whoever calls upon him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And then he goes on, he says, but not only has he delivered us, but he's delivered us from darkness. 
And that means he's rescued us. Can you imagine that? That God loves us so much. He, he saw what we were going on. He saw what was going on in the world. And he says that he rescued us. And we have this major problem in the world. I'm sure that all of you have seen it. The major problem includes drugs and alcohol, pornography, abortion, a country living politically divided. But the real problem isn't any one of these sins or the bondage of sin. The problem is in the heart of man. The problem is in the heart of man because only Jesus can free us. If we want to be free, if we want to live united, if we want to be one nation under God, we've got to get back to God. We've got to get back to the Savior. We've got to get back to surrendering and thinking the way I vote, the way I think, the way I live should be a biblical response to what Jesus has done for me. But the more that we move God out, He's saying, hey, I delivered you. And we see a prime example in the children of Israel, how he delivered them out of Egypt into the promised land. And he said, look, don't turn to the right or to the left or else. And what happens? We see the or else. Well, in, the, in, in today's day that we see that God has done the same thing. We have a great nation because it started off with Jesus Christ. It started off with some good principles. And we got to get back to these principles, the, the Bible. You see, he delivered us and he delivered us from the power of darkness. You know what's amazing about this? I, like maybe many in here today, I had a major problem with drugs. I was powerless. I couldn't get off of drugs. I couldn't stop drinking. I couldn't stop doing the things that I, I was so accustomed to doing until the day I met Jesus. And guess what? He rescued me. He rescued me and he gave, gave me the power. You know, he gave me the power to, to overcome, the power to overcome the temptation and, and all, everything that was, I was in bondage to. It was that whole drive, that draw for the drugs and the alcohol. It was only Jesus Christ. He had the power to deliver us. We can't be delivered in any other way. You know, it's amazing. We have this thing, it's, um, uh, we, 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 you know, darkness, when you think about it, it comes in many shapes or forms and we see it. There's anger and there's, you know, addictions, there's unforgiveness, there's bitterness and so on. But Jesus is the one that has the power to do that. He has the changing power to deliver us from all of that. It's interesting because even in this country and in the world today, what do we try and do to get people off drugs? We feed them more drugs. And what we need to do is we need to give these people to Jesus. If you want to be saved, if you want to be... Look, I, I am no different than any other drug addict that lives today, but I'm saved now. And I've been delivered. And many of you have as well. We've seen the power of God. But see, living in darkness is living with an agreement that in the ways of this world and its prince, you know, oh, it's okay, this should be okay, or that should be okay. See, when you're in agreement with the prince of the world, Satan, and agreeing with him, trying to convince you that, now oh, you're okay living without Christ, that's okay. That, that's following a, a, a false representation. Because, again, Satan doesn't want anybody in this world to think of eternity. When God created man in his image... Satan was upset. He wanted that notoriety. But Satan was upset. So as many people as he can take to hell with them, that's his desire. And so he doesn't want you to think about eternity. He doesn't want the world to think about eternity. He wants you to think, and many people to think that, that, that there is grass is greener on the other side. And that's why our suicide rate is up so much today. Listen, he wants you to live, speaking of the devil, he wants you to live for the now, for the moment. He wants you to live for the fullness of that this world has to offer. Jesus said, I've come to deliver. And then the other thing, the next thing in verse 13 is he says, he's transferred your orders. I love this because this takes a person of authority. He says, he has delivered us from the power of darkness and he didn't leave us there, just, but he says, and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love. It's like a military, a military tactic when a person, when the high ranking officer says, well, you're retiring from the military or you're going to be transferred, he comes and stamps your, your orders, and he says, you no longer have to go to Iraq or to third world countries, but we have you set over into Hawaii, and now you can retire there. Well, Jesus has done something like that. See, when we came to Jesus Christ, he's changed our orders. He's transferred our orders. Our orders were hell. But you were just born into it. And there's nothing that we, you know, say, well, I, I wanted to go there when we were just born that way. But coming to Christ, he says, now I've transferred your order. So we see that we have a transfer on our ticket of life. And it says, no longer hell, but heaven. And only Jesus can do that. He offers that to the world. He says, you know, I have the answer to all mankind. And because sin was, you know, because of sin, our orders were, again, the destination was hell. But sadly, 
we were born into it, no way of escaping it until Jesus came along. And again, listen, our orders from hell aren't from God. They're not from God. They're a choice from every man, woman, and child that wherever we make, whatever we want to do with all eternity, people today, just like you and I, we make choices. And there's consequences to those choices. We're still seeing consequences of some of the choices that we made throughout our lifetime. But the, the consequences that, or the choices that we make are very important. So again, our, loving, our God is a loving God. He's given us His Son as the ransom. He paid the ransom for us to get out of that uh, destination to hell. And He's given us a new place for the ransom of the sins of the world. God so loved, He so loves us that He will honor our choice that we make. And the third thing He says here in verse 14, He says that He's redeemed us. He says, in whom we have redemption. That means the ransom is paid in full. Through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. See, the word forgiveness means to send away. What they would do, it means to cancel a debt. What they would do in the Old Testament is they would bring a couple of goats up there and they would lay the hands, the leaders would lay the hands on the one goat and they would send it out into the wilderness. That's where you get the scapegoat from. Because the sins would be upon that goat and they would run out into the wilderness never to be seen again. And that was a picture of what Christ would do for you and I. The other goat the, the, the other goat would be sacrificed. And again, it's symbolically speaking of taking away our sins and never being seen again. Our sins never being seen again. This is what Jesus has done for you and I at the cross. The penalty of our sins paid in full. And there, there are many who have claimed, you know, to have a, a, a good things for your life. You know, they'll offer you things in life. It's amazing to see what's out there. You watch the late night infomercial. You got everything you don't need. Now they're there. But even the one problem with all these offers that come, not just from the infomercials, but the people that promise life and then promise good things for you, it doesn't matter what they are, there's one problem. And they might even be good looking, they might have a silent sounding angelic voice, and they might dress to impress, but none of them can do anything with the problem of sin. None of them. And if they, haven't, if they can't forgive you of your sins, then that generates another problem. Because if there's no forgiveness of sin, then there can be no guarantee of heaven. And if there's no guarantee of heaven, then our orders aren't changed. So it has to come with this substantial. What, is, what has Christ done for us? He's redeemed us. And also, none of them can uh, deliver you from the power of darkness. None of them. And so you see that we were all born into sin. And I know what you might be thinking. You say, well, I didn't come. I didn't want that. I mean, what, what's up with that? I mean, that's not part of the package. It's not fair. And I tell my kids when they were younger, they'd say, Dad, that's not fair. And I say, you know what a fair is? He goes, what? And I says, where you pay $2.50 to go in and get a bunch of rides and eat some cotton candy. That's a fair. <laughs> the life's not fair. <laughs> but, but you might say, you know what? That's not fair. I didn't want that in the package. What did I do to deserve that? And I'll tell you, you're right. But that's why God sent his son for the ransom of many. That's why Jesus came and for God so loved the world that he died, he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. That's why. It's not fair. He understands that. But he sacrificed and sent the sacrifice of his own son. So those are some pretty serious claims that Jesus has made. But the serious question still remains, how can they be true? Or what, what credentials does he have to back them up? You know, I want to see what, what are the credentials? What does he have to substantiate that he isn't just another fly-by-night yuppie who's brought up on locust and wild honey and all this stuff? Oh, I mean, we see enough of them today. What, what if he's not just one of those? So what, what, what qualifications does he have to claim the things that he's done for you and for I and the claims for the world? What is this that Jesus is to be shown as supreme over the entire universe? Well, as he continues, Paul points this out in verse 15. He says he's the image of the invisible God. Listen, he's the image of the invisible God. What this means is, is just as you see him, you're seeing the image of the invisible God. Nobody's seen God the Father. But just as a coin would have uh, uh, the image of a president's face on it, so too Jesus was, it was he was the image of the invisible God. Jesus said of himself in John 14, he says, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. And so anyone who has seen Christ in his visible manifestation of the invisible God has thereby seen God indirectly. So he's saying, you know what? 
this is who I am. This is incredible because he's the image of the invisible God. And there are many who can claim that. I mean, you think about the claims that we try and make today or the things that the world is running after, and we're always running after something to be more like Mike or more like the Kardashians or we're looking to be something to pattern our lives after, and it's all a disaster. But Jesus says, listen, I am the image of the invisible God. I am the one who came. And then he says in in verse 15 again, he says, listen, that he's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. So he's building this resume and he's showing it to the people and Paul wants them to know that you don't have to believe in another God. You don't have to believe in anything other because here is Jesus, the firstborn over all creation. What does that mean? Well, it means that it indicates two things of Christ. First, he preceded the whole creation and that he is also sovereign over all creation. You see, there are people like David Koresh or Jim Jones or even recently Louis Farrakhan who claim to be the Messiah. And many of them have claimed one time or another, but none of them were able to make this claim being first born over all creation. That like, settles it. You know, you're like in a conversation. You ever get in those places to where you're like, you know, I can do this or my fish was that big and my fish was this big until you get to the picture of it. And you're saying, is that the fish you were talking about? Was that the one right there? I said, well, well, yeah, (laughs) you know, maybe. And then you just can't claim the Messiah, being the Messiah without being the firstborn over all creation. I mean, that's who he is. I've always been here. I'm the first and last. I'm the Alpha and the Omega. I'll always be here. And so not only did he create all things, but it says that he created all things and they were created by him and for him in verse 16 and 17. It says, for by him, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him all things consist. So Paul wanted these, the church to know because there's so many other claims out there. There's so many other people saying they have the answer. That's why it's so important that as a church, we stick to the code. We stick to Jesus Christ and him crucified. So Paul said to the Corinthians, he says, I've come not to tell you anything other than Jesus Christ and him crucified. So not only did they come to this place to where Christ is the only one through whom all things can be, but he's the only one by whom all things can continue. You know, if you were to take one of these self-proclaiming messiahs, And they were saying that I have all things into my hands. I'm holding all things together. Once they die, what would happen? Become total chaos. If they said that they were holding your life together and they died, they're no longer able to help you hold your life together. They're no longer able to help with the things that they said that they can help with because they're dead. And if you, you know, any of these self-proclaiming messiahs, once they died, once they were buried, we would have an issue with them being God. Because again, once they died and because they remained dead, if they indeed were the subject to, to continue to keep all things in existence, then once they died, all things would just fall apart. The word consist means this, to set together. It's like he holds all the molecules together. He's holding your bodies from falling apart farther than they're faster than they're falling apart. He's holding our cars together. He's just the one that holds it all together. The universe, the stars that are out there, the waters, the reproductive system and everything that's there. See, without, thing, without Jesus holding these things together, we have a major problem because we would all just fall apart. Just think about life without Christ. I remember, I don't know if you guys, you probably remember your life without Christ. He says, I, now I hold it together. I'm so thankful that he you know, held the universe together this whole time. But prior to knowing Jesus Christ, prior to coming to him, my life was a mess. And now I see and I reflect and see, Lord, if you can hold the stars together, you can hold my life together. He's been doing a pretty good job. See, without Jesus holding it all together, then we have major problems. And you think of this, you think of in our lives, in our marriages, in our, in our children, our families, there's families falling apart. Listen, fix it with Jesus. He's like that glue. He's not, he better than the Gorilla Glue or any super glue. He's that cosmic glue that holds all things together. If he can hold together 
this universe and everything that exists in this universe, then he can hold your life together. And then in verse 18, he says that he is the head of the body of the church. There he is, the head of the body of the church. Every Christian and every person that comes together in the body of Christ, they have Jesus Christ as the head. There's no human person that's higher than another. I may be the pastor of this church. I'm not higher than anybody else. I don't reign supreme. There's none of that. There's the Greek word usage here means source or origin or leader. But Jesus Christ is truly the source of the church. He's the source of his body and the leader. There's no, no believer on earth. Nobody on earth has, you know, is the head. There's nobody in charge of the church except Jesus Christ. And that's why there's a problem. And we need to see Jesus Christ as being the head of the church and not man. But this position is reserved exclusively for Jesus Christ. And then if you look at verse 18 again, he says that he is the firstborn from the dead. That's why we come together today. See, he says, and he is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning of the firstborn from the dead. Now, you know, why is it that Jesus can hold all this together? Because he's still alive. He's still alive. I mean, it's incredible because all other religions, all other claims from Savior wannabes have to bow to this claim. Once they die, where are they? They're in the grave. And what good are they for you then? You know, you know they've, they've all said that, you know, hey, I've got this promise for you. I can do that for you. Even if they promise you some type of, re- some type of redemption or they promise you some type of deliverance, they can't substantiate, substantiate their claims uh, with this radical work of the resurrection. They're all dead, every last one of them. I mean, you look at the graves out there, Confucius or uh, Muhammad or any of these things, and there they are. You want to go visit them, you can visit them. But Jesus Christ, you go to the tomb of Jesus Christ and he's not there. I've been to Israel. You go to, you go to any tomb in Israel that has that stone rolled away and he's not there because he's alive. And we're so thankful for that. That's confidence that this world can have that we're not placing our faith in a political party, but in a risen Savior. That's confidence that we can have as men and women who don't deserve to be saved, but he came to die for us. That we might be saved. Because he still lives, so too can we live. It's incredible. And so the teaching on the resurrection, one of the most important things that I see is in the early days of the church, that there was never ever a doubt that Jesus Christ raised from the dead. Even today, people don't really uh, deny the fact. But, But even back in the day when the gospel was first going out, it was not only accurate, but it was accepted by the church. And so when the disciples preached the gospel, none of the people were, that were against what they call the way tried to deny the resurrection. They clearly knew it was valid and it was, its teaching was valid and there was no doubt about it. When Peter, I think of this, when Peter gave his first message, here you have a bunch of knucklehead fishermen, right? Jesus ascends to heaven and the Holy Spirit comes upon these uh, disciples and here he is. And one thing that he told them when he was answering questions about the Holy Spirit, because uh, they thought that they had been drunk and everything, so he began to ask them, answer them questions. And in Acts chapter 2, verse 30, it says this, Peter speaking, therefore being a prophet and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on the throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul will not be left in Hades, uh, nor his flesh uh, see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, and uh, of which we are all witnesses. So, I mean, it wasn't like, you, there was, the Bible says that there were 500 at one time in agreement. They saw Jesus. So it's not like, well, I don't believe that he rose from the dead. Well, you better get those, you know, eyewitnesses make a lot in a court of law. And they, they, they're here and they're saying, man, you know what? We saw this. And Peter has no, you know, no hard feelings. just saying, you know what? Let me just tell you like it is. Jesus rose from the dead and you guys saw it. You guys saw, you're all witnesses of it. And Jesus was the firstborn from the dead. And then in verse 19, it says, in him all the fullness should dwell. And so Paul reminds him, he says, in verse 19, For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. And this is one of the most powerful descriptions of Christ's deity in the New Testament. 
Here you have the fullness. It means um, the meaning is repletion or it means completely full of something or completion. What Paul is talking about here is he writes about the fullness was really just another way to say that Jesus is truly God. There's a world out there that is hurting. And you may be in that same position this morning. Maybe you're hurting. Maybe you can't understand what's going on around you. I can't make any promises on what tomorrow holds, but I can tell you that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And that's what we need to hear today. That's what our world needs to hear today. Jesus himself had no problems making this claim. He says, look, I'm the Son of God. I am. Seven times he said, I am, through the Gospels. And this statement is a statement that nobody else is qualified to make. And he sends out this invitation to be received of what you and I need. It was the only one that can be qualified to do what he says he can do. Take away our sin, that he would, you know, remove the guilt of sin. And then in verse 20, we see that the seventh thing, he says that he reconciled. And reconciliation only comes through Jesus Christ. In verse 20, he says, and by him to reconcile all things to himself by him, whether the things on the earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood uh, through the blood of his cross. You see, this phrase, all things, is limited. When Jesus was speaking all things, or when Paul was writing this of all things, he says this, he says, it, it, it refers to the good angels in heaven and redeemed people. You see, redemption can only come from those who or on the earth, or in heaven. Paul wrote these words to the church of Philippi, and I'm going to clarify that. In chapter 2, Paul wrote this. He said, Therefore God has highly exalted him, speaking to Jesus, and he's given him the name which is above every name, that on the name of Jesus every knee should bow. So that's a guarantee, that every knee will bow. But he says, look, of those in heaven, on those on earth, and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. See, the things under the earth are not reconcilable. They've already made that decision. The people, well, it's not like, you know, you play golf. Some of you guys are golfers and you know what a mulligan is. It's not even listed in the rules of golf, but you know what a mulligan is. It's a do-over, right? And so you have this do-over to where you lose your ball and you get another ball and you drop it down. You use your Nike foot wedge to kick it out in the fairway and you, <laughs> you kind of hit it up to the green. Well, life doesn't happen like that. Jesus says, you're alive now, you have a choice to make. And I will redeem, and reconciliation only comes through me. See, that was lost in the garden with Adam. There was a reconciliation of Jesus, uh, that Jesus has brought that would reconcile what Adam lost in the garden that we can have back in our own lives be con- being reconciled. So reconciliation takes place now while we're here on earth. And you and I are re- the responsible ones. We're the ones to make things right with Jesus before we die. Because once we die, it's too late. Listen, this is important. Because as I read in the book of of, uh, Philippians, it says that every knee should bow, but only those who are reconciled by the blood of Jesus Christ will enter heaven. What was God doing? Going back to that question, what was He doing? Was He making this big mistake? Did He have something that, you know, oh no... (laughs) You know, was he, was he, did he do things that weren't right? Not at all. He was sending his sacrificial lamb into the world, his son, who takes away the sins of the world, who's able to take away the sins of the world, that whoever shall believe in, in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That was God's plan. He knew it wasn't fair. He knew exactly how we were all brought up. He, knew, he knows exactly how life went. He knows all about that. And that's why he sent his son to die. The only thing that can ever help this world, the only thing that can ever help you and I is Jesus Christ. And having, you know, the question might be, have you received that? Have you received the grace of God to be reconciled back to him? I mean, this is, we're all, we all have an appointment with eternity. We all have this appointment to where we have to deal with the issue. What did you do with Jesus Christ? Or... Maybe like some, we can be relying on this religion of another man who tries to make these claims or some other point. Well, I think it to be this way. Jesus has given you his his resume. He's saying, look, there's my resume and I am the savior of the world. He he desires to be savior of your life. He He wants to be the one that would 
come in and, and rule and reign and just say, you know what, I want to cleanse the house. I want to forgive you. I want to, I want to heal your hurts. I want to do all of this stuff because he's the one who's qualified. So has he delivered you from the power of darkness? Has he transferred your orders? Has he redeemed you? Those are the questions we ask of ourselves this morning. And if anybody claims to be any of these, he must also substantiate then with his resume qualifying him to be Savior. And I think Jesus has done that. And I want to make a last kind of point here as we close up. And the last point is you say, well, I'm a believer for a long time. That was a great evangelistic message. But you know, now I'm a believer. What about for me? What do I do? See, as we close, there's the application in verse 18. I want to read that again. It says, he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things that he may have preeminence. You see, for you and I who have accepted Jesus Christ, he desires to be preeminent. That means first. That's exactly in, in rank or, or influence. He, he, he means first. He doesn't want to play second fiddle to your program, to your life, to your calendar, to your busy schedule. He wants to be first in everything because he can direct your steps. He can direct you. He can guide you. He can give you light on a dark day. He wants to be first. He doesn't, you know, you think about how bad we need him. And then I remember coming to Christ in December 9th, 1989. I gave my life to Christ. I didn't ever want to let him go. And I found out he had me. I didn't really have him. But that was good enough. He would never let me go. He would always direct my steps. He would always take me. And he, and he just says, listen, I just want to have preeminence in your life. I want to be number one in your life. I, I just don't want to, you know, die for your sins. I don't want you to go home and think, okay, you know what? You, you've accepted me. But now, Christian, I want you to be, I want to be all that you need me to be. I want to be your healer. I want to be your forgiver. I want to be your counselor. And so many times we rush through this world and we compact our world with so much stuff that he's not preeminent anymore. That day we needed him, we called out for to be saved. It was like, yes, that's what I need. And he says, where have you gone? Where have you done? Where have you been? And, as, and, and Jesus just beckons for the church today. Look, at, I'm ready to come home. Are you ready? I'm ready to take you home. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you just ready? Are you living away? I mean, when, when the Bible says when Christ comes, when the Son of Man comes, will he find the faith on the earth? Will he find that men and women who, who he died for, who received that, that uh, gift of eternal life, will they come to him? Will they still be finding him, having faith in him, trusting in him, calling out to him, praying with him, fellowship, fellowshipping with him, and all these things? This is what Jesus desires from us, to be first in everything. So yes, he substantiates, yes, he, his claims are true. And for if you're here this morning, you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, he wants you to know that. That his grace will forgive you of all of your sins, past, present, and even future. But church, also that you and I know that Christ commands preeminence. He desires to be first. He desires to be everything and so this Resurrection Sunday, He desires to be brought back to life in your life. He desires to be back on a throne. I mean, that's a great call. You see, this is what Jesus desires, is to be first in our lives. Careers, marriages, families, directing us, all in the Bible. It's His deep Greek word. It means all. That's what it means. So your, has, your, has your relationship with Jesus been sadly set you know aside has it been lost in the caverns of religion or the busyness and he says you know what i want to revive it i want to revive i want to have that that relationship that is so strong you see the need to be more born again and the need to be revived jesus is alive to make himself available to all who are in need whether it's salvation or redemption or whether it's redemption or or revival you see he desires that but the only way he revives is the only way the only the only thing he can bring, bring back to life is that which once had life and his desire to redeem those who are not redeemed yet and then to revive his church that we might be without spot for his glory would you bow your heads and pray with me